אני לעצמי ואף אחד לא איתי מה אני כשאני בנפרד כי אני יהודי לא הולך לבדי רק איתך ידידי יד ביד עם אחד שיר אחד בוא אחי ותן לי יד ונוכל לשמוח ולרקוד יחד כאיש אחד בן לב אחד לא רוצה להיות לבד רק לנצח שבט אחים גם יחד פעם אחת שיר אחד בוא אחי ותן לי יד ונוכל לשמוח ולרקוד יחד כאיש אחד בן לב אחד לא רוצה להיות לבד רק לנצח שבט אחים גם יחד Shabbat Shalom, friends. I just want to bring greetings to you all the way from Kehilat Bethlehem. And I just want to thank you from all over the place who all you're watching. I just want to thank you for joining us this morning. And I pray that this morning you, along with us, will enjoy and celebrate the goodness of God. Friends, before we go ahead and do anything else this morning, we have a very special guest speaker. who will be speaking concerning Hanukkah, the end days, and how to prepare ourselves in these last days. If, you have, if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, if you go below your video, and if you see show more, there are notes to follow along with the teaching in a couple of minutes. It will say click here for notes, and you can go there and do it. If it's on Facebook also, below the video, search, For the place where it says click here for notes and you can 
download the digital copy of the notes for you as you go along with the teaching so you can keep up with the pace and keep up with the scriptures and you can download it for your personal use for your education also in the future this this morning we really we are in pasha varshalak if you have not gotten a chance to listen to our teaching which i did last night it's on youtube it's on facebook just search for pasha varshalak and we learn something very powerful concerning the name of jacob and israel it's worth listening to it's worth studying it's worth taking your time to listen so i really encourage you to really go ahead and check that out and study with us this week what another thing which really struck my mind was uh, when jacob and esau when jacob was coming to meet esau the bible says that uh, esau wanted to give him some resources and jacob wanted to have give him also some resources and i love the expression which jacob said i have everything the question is jacob said i have everything this morning i want to ask each of our viewers who are watching us what do you have in this week's pasha when yakob reconciles with esav he attempted to bless his brother with material goods to which esav turned down saying ish li raf in genesis 33:9 which means i have abundance is what esav said after being denied yakov insisted that his brother accept his material gifts because he himself also where he says ishli coal has been blessed with abundance the question is what is the difference between esav's ishli rav i have abundance and jacob's ishli coal i have everything both the brothers use the same expression in hebrew ishli i have but the difference is esau uses the word rav which means great and yakko uses the word kol which means all or everything when a person truly believes in hashab they know that all they possess in this world has been divinely ordained and that means they know that whatever they have in life is exactly what they need friends if hashem blessed you with riches those riches are accompanied by additional obligations one blessed with an abundance of riches is obligated to support the spreading of hashem's torah the support of spreading the torah is not optional rather it is a part of one's financial success in this world for this reason the true believer understands that he never has plenty but he has everything everything that he needs to fulfill all his obligations on this earth the unbeliever on the other hand does not feel that the possession of material wealth comes with any obligation they have earned their money and therefore they are only obligated to look after their own welfare the difference between the expressions used by jacob when he says in hebrew yesh li kol i have everything and isa when he says ishli rav i have abundance yako jacob understood that he possessed everything he was in possession of everything that he needed to do the things that hashem wanted him to do isa on the other hand thought he has he, he was free to do as he pleased with his material possession 
What is the point that we can understand from these things? What is the principle? Every one of us must realize that Hashem does not give us more than we need. When a person is blessed with prosperity, he must recognize his responsibility to strive to support God's Torah. This is the very purpose of prosperity. The insight or the in, inner meaning to this episode between Jacob and es Esau is not limited to money. Many people have been blessed with certain gifts, talents, riches. And instead of understanding that they have been blessed with everything, they need to serve Hashem in this world. They are not content until they acquire the riches of the world. Like Esau said, I have abundance. The support of Torah is not just limited to the financial backing of a yeshiva or a synagogue, but investing in every single letter of the Torah in your soul. In the business world, there is this concept of ROI or return on investment. If you claim to be a believer, but you are not internalizing God's Torah, God cannot trust, trust you with spiritual prosperity. Your flesh, your evil inclination, your etzahara is like Esau. It says, I have abundance of this physical world, but your soul desires the abundance of God's presence. If God has blessed you with unique gifts or talents or riches, you need to start utilizing what he has given you to fulfill your purpose in this world. And you need to reject the desire of the flesh to acquire the abundance of this world because God has already given you everything you need. Friends, I pray that we would use whatever we have in terms of talents, gifts or needs. May we use it for expanding the kingdom of God and benefiting that the Torah be taken all over the world. With that said, I want to give you all the opportunity this morning before we even listen to God's word to take time to give. Give unto Hashem so that you will not only be blessed physically, but you will be blessed spiritually in your walk with Hashem. There is a link online. You can give online and may Hashem bless you. We're going to take, a, in a couple of minutes, we're going to take time to pray for each of your needs. If you have a pressing need in your heart and you want us to pray for it, this is the time right now to go ahead and put it in the chat so that we can pick it up one by one. If you have an unspoken need that you want us to pray about, go ahead and put that and say, it's an unspoken need. We will lift up your needs in prayer. Let's thank the Lord this morning. Father, we want to gratefully, we thank you, O living and eternal King, for you have returned our soul within us with compassion. Great is your faithfulness. Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his mitzvahs and commanded us concerning the washing of hands. Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, King of the universe, who formed man with wisdom, cleared, created in him many openings and many channels, Clear and evident from before your glorious throne is that if one of them were close to rupture, a person could no longer live. Blessed are you, Hashem, who heals all flesh and performs wonders. Bless Hashem, O oh my soul. Hashem, my God, you are very great. You have donned majesty and splendor, cloaked in light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a curtain. How precious is your kindness, O God. The sons of Adam take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They satisfy themselves with the abundance of your house and they drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the source of life and in your light we shall see light. Bestow your kindness upon those who know you and your righteousness upon the upright of heart. We are connecting our prayers this morning to the, to the master Yeshua, the Messiah, who is the source of eternal salvation. May I remain in him the fa and the father like a branch remains in the vine. Let our prayer be like an incense before you and the lifting of our hands like an afternoon offering. 
Amen and Amen. We'll continue taking up your needs. So if you have a need, I would really encourage you right now, go ahead and put your needs on the chat so that we can pick it up and we can start praying for you. And I really pray that we will, Hashem, God has blessed us with every need possible. And that need, whatever God has given us, is not for your luxury so that you can just expand your kingdom. It is to build the kingdom of God and invest for the Torah to be spread throughout the world. So I really encourage you that you would take this Shabbat, make it your priority to use your giftings, to use your talents, to use your resources in building the kingdom of God, and especially building the work of Hashem in India in this crucial time, in this crucial season. With that said, let's sing a couple of songs and let's celebrate and we will pray for your needs in a minute. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord. The word says this is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice. You have a choice to rejoice in the midst of all the evil and the darkness that is around the world. You and I are not called to be afraid because he's not given us the spirit of fear, but of courage and of sound mind. You know, I... I've, the scripture that comes to my mind today, this morning, is from Isaiah chapter 26, verses 3. He sa It says, you keep in perfect peace one whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And the question is, upon whom or on what is your mind stayed on? I pray that this morning, the Shabbat, if we've been off the alignment, it's the time to go into the workshop, get yourself aligned to the word of the Lord, to Hashem, to put our focus back on Him. Let's begin this morning with saying the prayers, Matovu, Ohalechayachov. This is the prayer that came out, the words, very words that came out of the prophet Bilam. He wanted to come and curse Israel, but when he saw, he wanted to put an eye in Hara, an evil eye, a stingy eye. But you know, he could not do that because he saw the house of Israel in order. I pray that we who are engrafted into the Lord, our homes will be in order. The house of Israel will get in order. And that the Shekinah of God can fill it. Amen. Machovu. Oh, hallelujah, Mishken Israel. Thank you. 
how pleasant are your tents, O Yaakov. Your dwellings, Israel, and I in your great kindness will enter your house, prostrating towards your holy sanctuary in all of you. And Adonai, I love your house, the resting place of your glory. I will prostrate and bow, kneel before Adonai, my creator, and, and I, may my prayer to you, Adonai, be at a time of favor. God, in your great kindness, answer me in your true salvation. We're going to move on to Adon Olam, declaring him the Lord of the universe, who has been there. He is, he is from the beginning. There is no end. Yes, to man. Adon Olam, Asher Mala, Naterem Po, Yetzir Nibra, Et Nasa, Meket Soko, Azai Melek, Azai Melek, Shemo Nikra, Yakari, Kotako, Levado, If you have a prayer read, we want you to go ahead and put down your prayers into the chat box. 
and we'll be taking them up right now to pray. Thank you, Avinu Shabbat Shemaim. We thank you for this wonderful, blessed, joyful Shabbat morning that you have given us, all of us as a community, to come before you, worship you, joy, and bring before your presence our needs, Father. Abba, we thank you, Lord. You pray for Brother Shiju, Lord, for his unspoken request. Abba, I pray that you know the heart of every person. Your word says that before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, Abba. And Father, we know that you know his needs, and I pray that you will meet him at the point of his need, and you will listen to it, you will grant it, Abba, and you will bless him. Pray for Dimpy, O Lord. And, his, uh, her, uh, and we pray for Pramodhani, for, for her unspoken need, Abba Father, we pray that you will meet her at her point of need and you will grant the wishes of our heart. I pray that our desires as we put forward, O Lord, would align with your kingdom, will, will align with your heart, O Lord Father, as your servant, David Hamelech, O Lord Father, that you would be able to say that our heart is aligned with yours, O Lord Abba Father, and for that we come to your presence. Father, we pray for Smitha, O Lord, Father. I pray for our health, O Lord, as she's down with cold and breathing issue, Lord. Abba, Father, I pray that the restoration will start from deep within her, O Lord, Abba, Father. That the restoration will start from her spirit and come outwards into her body. That she would be made whole, O Lord, Abba, Father. That she would be made whole in her spirit and in her body, O Lord, Abba, Father, this morning. We pray for Pallavi, Lord Father, for her parents' health and salvation. Abba Father, I pray this Shabbat morning, Lord, that as we pray that their eyes would be open to see their Messiah, I pray that as we are even praying that all of Israel, their eyes would be open to see the Messiah. Father, I pray that we pray for Pallavi's parents, O Lord, that you would give them a divine revelation in this season of Hanukkah, Lord Abba Father. Father, we thank you for all the needs that have been put up here, Lord Abba Father, and all the needs that people are having this morning. Father, I pray that each one was part of this community, Father. I pray that you would meet them this morning, O Lord Abba Father. And I pray that you would speak to our hearts as we sit down to study from your word, O Lord Father, that we would not be passive in listening to your word, but we would be active, O Lord Father, in doing and listening, O Lord Abba Father, so that we would do as all of Israel, O Lord Father, said on that day near Mount Sinai, Naseh Vanishma, that we will do and we will hear, O Lord Abba Father. For that we come to your presence. The name of Messiah, Yeshua. Amen. 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 Shabbat Shalom, friends. I just want to thank you so much for joining us from all over the world. This is a great Shabbat here from India. We want to bring greetings to you from uh, Kehilat Bethlehem. And we just want to welcome you all and thank you so much for taking time to come and join us this morning. This morning, we are having a very special guest speaker. But before he comes in to teach God's word, I just want to let you know that if, uh, if he has his uh, notes available for us to go through the scriptures, it's on YouTube and on Facebook. If you go down to the video and see show more, it will say link for the notes. Just click on the link and download it and get it ready so that in a minute as he comes to listen, as he comes to come and share the word, you can go along with him. Now, our guest speaker this morning is Pastor Mark Bills. Pastor Mark Bills is uh, the senior pastor and the founder of El Shaddai Ministries in Seattle, Washington. When we began our journey into the Hebrew roots, Jewish roots of our faith, Pastor Mark Bills has been the most gracious and generous person to help us in this walk. El Shaddai Ministries and Pastor Mark because of their 
association with us and because of their support with us we have we ha he has helped us all these years and even till today we are grateful to that and we are so thankful that what we have learned from him and still learning from him is we carry on in this time and during the season pastor mark has written so many great books if you have not taken time to read any of them i would really encourage you to read one of one main book he has written many years ago is called the feast of the lord and how the feast of the lord is not only for the jewish people and it is for everyone who believes in the lord so if you have not taken time to listen to his teaching concerning the feast of the lord you should buy his book and uh, go ahead and read it another book during the blood moons time he he talked about the blood moons and how it affects the nations and we see that soon after the blood moons so many things have been ch ch changing all over the world a couple of years ago later on he also wrote a book called decoding the antichrist decoding of the antichrist friends we have a couple of copies in our store it is amatstore.com you can go ahead and buy that book if you desire to buy that book but in that book you will hear what is happening now may if i would would have told you many years ago that there will be a time that all of us will be on the internet none of us would have believed but many of the things that are written in that book in decoding the antichrist pastor mark brings out some of these things and some of these issues and also some of the issues concerning where the virus comes from so i really pray that if you have not got the opportunity to read the book decoding the antichrist please go ahead to amatstore.com and buy the book for yourself and read it so that you would know what is happening i really pray that the body of messiah will stop being so super spiritual that we don't know what is happening in our vicinity in our surroundings and we will be left in lack because of that recently pastor mark has come out with his newest book his newest book is called decoding prophet jeremiah this is a powerful book i know many of us have not even taken time to read in our bible jeremiah but it is this book talks about what is happening to us today this book is available on amazon in here in india you you're not as of now able to get the book physically but it, the kindle kindle version of the book is available for us in india for around the world i would encourage you to check if you are able to buy the book i would really encourage you to buy this book decoding the prophet jeremiah it is very important to understand the words of prophet jeremiah which he told to the people of israel many many years ago and how it is applicable for us in our days and seasons soon after pastor mark speaks at the end we will be listening to his interview with sid roth which he gave concerning this book but before we bring pastor mark i just thought i will show you a small clipping about what this book is all about from his own mouth so listen and i would really encourage you if you are able to buy it in the us go ahead and buy it don't miss the opportunity those of us in this part of the world if you are able to read a kindle version of it go ahead and buy the kindle version but let's read a preview of a uh, listen to a preview of decoding the prophet jeremiah Shalom, I'm Pastor Mark Biltz of El Shaddai Ministries, and I am so excited about how people will respond to my new book, Decoding the Prophet Jeremiah. The prophetic warnings that Jeremiah speaks to his generation are echoing loudly in the ears of all those who have ears to hear in our day as well. It is a time of total chaos politically, religiously, militarily, which is even seen in the very structure of this book. In the book of Jeremiah, the chapters aren't in chronological order, but it's as if they've been all cut up, thrown into the air, and however they landed was the order they put it back together in. 
So I carefully placed the chapters back in the chronological order that they should be read in. We find throughout the of the people, there are false prophets leading the people astray, and the religious leaders are more concerned about keeping their position than listening to God. God's people are serving him mainly through tradition and under pretense, preferring to listen to the false prophets who are speaking words of a coming false peace. We will look at the historical backdrop of what led to these coming judgments and the wild twists and turns involved. We're going to see how the prophet Isaiah's daughter married Hezekiah, and as a single mother, she raises a monster known as Manasseh, one of the most wicked kings in history who actually kills his grandpa Isaiah by sawing him in half. We bring the, in the words of the other prophets of the day and their prophetic words as well. We bring in the books of Ezekiel and Daniel and how the events overlap during Jeremiah's day, such as when King Jehoiakim threw three leaves of the word of the Lord into the fire in Jerusalem. We see it was at the same year that Nebuchadnezzar threw the three Hebrew children into the fire as well. And just as the word of the Lord was thrown into the fire in Jerusalem, we see the word of the Lord now appears in the fires of Babylon to save them. I also include timeline charts in the book to help piece everything together. We'll go over Jeremiah's book of Lamentations as well, which is all about order in the midst of chaos. That is only seen from the Hebrew, as every chapter in Lamentations is actually an acrostic of the Hebrew alphabet. Be a part of this amazing journey as we read about a 23-year-old prophet who's not afraid to speak truth to power even as he stands completely alone with everyone out to kill him. His family, his fellow priests, his neighbors, the princes, the kings. And then God even commands him never to get married. This man is all alone. He is one man standing against the powers that be, being God's point man to the people, proclaiming God's heartbreak over the coming judgments, which could be avoided if his people will only repent. Help spread the word so many discover God's heart for his people in this generation by decoding the prophet Jeremiah. Shalom, I'm Pastor Mark Bills. So friends, I really, really encourage you. Friends, I really, really encourage you to go ahead and get a copy of this book. We are trying to work it out with Pastor Mark and with El Shaddai Ministries to get a couple of copies, a box of box or two boxes of copies here for our Indian stores so that those of us locally can buy it easily. So we'll work on that as, as much as possible. But until then, if you're able to buy it, if Kindle version is good, I would really encourage you to go ahead and buy it. But because I believe without a shadow of doubt, the words of the ancient prophet uh, Jeremiah and what he told to the nation of Israel many, many years ago is still applicable for us in our generation, in our times and seasons where we are living in. So with all my heart and as a family and as a ministry, we want to join our hearts and we want to welcome Pastor Mark Bills into our midst. There. How, well, hello, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Pastor. It's so good to have you. We just want to thank you for taking. I know it's late at night for you, but thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to listen to you live. And all of us are here ready and welcoming you from India. And we want you to bring in God's word in the season during this time. Well, thank you so much, Pastor Joe. I really appreciate you and Susan and all that you have been doing over the last decade, a long time uh, in helping to take the Torah to the nations. Uh, you're, you're a good and faithful servant. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Hey, it's all I, yours, Pastor. You can go ahead and start. Well, I was just going to say, since you mentioned Vayishlak, does any, can anyone tell me in the chat room or can you tell me how old Jacob and Esau was uh, when they met. How old was Jacob when he wrestled the angel? Does anybody know? Does anybody want to guess in the chat room how old Jacob was when he wrestled the angel? 
All right, I see 70. That's great. That's close. Anybody else? <clears throat> well, believe it or not, Jacob was 97. He was 97 years old. I have a timeline chart on our website where uh, anybody that wants to can go and they can see the timeline uh, of exactly what happened. But with that said, uh, let's start uh, our lesson. And I have a question since we're talking about Hanukkah. Can anyone in the chat room or Pastor Joe, uh, can anyone tell me where Hanukkah is mentioned in the Bible? Well, I can tell you right now, Does it, I don't know if anybody knows, but Hanukkah, m most people know it's mentioned in the Gospel of John. But the big question is, in the Old Testament, can anyone tell me the first mention of Hanukkah? Well, the first mention of Hanukkah is in about 1500 BC. When we look at uh, the dedication of Moses' tabernacle, from Numbers chapter 7 and verse 10. It talks about how all the princes were bringing the dedication offering of the altar in the day that it was anointed. Well, the Hebrew word for dedication is Hanukkah. And so we find in number 788, it says this was the dedication or Hanukkah of the altar after it was anointed. Well, what's amazing is the word anointed basically is Mashiach. So here we find the first time mention of Hanukkah in the Bible is at the dedication of Moses' tabernacle, and it has to do with the Messiah. Wow. Well, where else do we find the, uh, the word Hanukkah in the Bible besides the dedication of Moses' tabernacle in around 1500 BC? Well, look at this. Solomon's temple in 1000 BC. We look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 8 and 9, and it talks about how Solomon kept the feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, for seven days. And it says all of Israel was with them. There was a great congregation. And then it says on the eighth day, they held a sacred assembly for they observed the dedication of the altar. Guess what? That's the word Hanukkah. So we see they Hanukkahed Moses' tabernacle. They Hanukkahed also Solomon's temple. And the eighth day is when everything that is dedicated belongs to the Lord. Look at Exodus chapter 22 and verse 30. It says, likewise shall you do with your ox and your sheep. Seven days it'll belong with its mother. But guess what? On the eighth day, you shall give it to me. So we find that the eighth day, everything belongs to the Lord. And that's when it's dedicated or Hanukkah to God. Well, then what do we find? In uh, 700 BC, uh, well, okay, let's, let me tell you this. Before I go into 700 BC, let me give you some reasons for keeping Hanukkah. So Hanukkah really is about rededicating the temple. That's what it is all about. It's also, and aren't you supposed to be God's temple? So the reason to keep Hanukkah is it's the time for you to rededicate yourself as God's temple. It's also about being persecuted for righteousness sake. That's another reason to keep Hanukkah. Well, if we look at the next slide as well, we're going to see it's about not hiding your light under a bushel. We're not supposed to hide our light under a bushel. Also, we will come to realize that prophetically, Hanukkah is going to happen again because there's nothing new under the sun. And then the next thing is we need to know Yeshua kept Hanukkah. All right, so let's look at this next slide and you're going to see Yeshua actually kept the feast of Hanukkah. So with that said, let me go back before we go to the next slide. Let's go ahead and look at 700 BC. What do we see here in 2 Chronicles 28? Now, this is verse 22 through 25. Here, the temple had been defiled. 
And King Ahaz gathers together all the vessels of the house of God. And look at this. He cuts them into pieces. And then he shuts the doors of the house of the Lord. He made altars in every corner of Jerusalem. And in every city of Judah, he made high places to burn incense to other gods. And he provoked God to anger. Well, what happens? Now, since he totally defiled the temple, they need to rededicate it again. And so we see in 2 Chronicles 29, this is verse 15 through 17. What did they do? They gathered their brethren, they sanctified themselves, and they all came according to the commandment of the king by the words of the Lord. And what do they have to do? They have to cleanse the house of the Lord. This sounds exactly like what happened at Hanukkah. And here they go. They're cleansing the house of the Lord. And they brought out all the uncleanness that they had found in the temple and in the court of the house of the Lord. And then it says the Levites took it. They carried it out abroad to the brook Kidron. And then it says they began on the first day of the first month. That's Nisan. That's the month when Passover is to sanctify it. So on the first day, they began to sanctify the temple. And on the eighth day, there it is again, uh, of the month, they came to the porch of the Lord and they sanctified the house of the Lord in eight days. So eight is very significant. And that's why Hanukkah is eight days long. And it's all about dedication of the temple and we're to be God's temple and we need to cleanse this temple. So Hanukkah is a yearly reminder that we need to cleanse this temple and dedicate ourselves to the Lord. Well, what happens a couple hundred years later? This is in 500 BC. And if you remember, Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon came and destroyed the temple, Jerusalem, burned it all to the ground. And now uh, Cyrus has said it's okay to rebuild the temple. You have Ezra, Nehemiah, all of that where they're trying to rebuild the temple. Well, look at this. In Ezra 6, it says it was in the first year of Cyrus, the king, this same Cyrus, the king, made a decree concerning the house of God of Jerusalem. And he says, let the house be built. All right. And so he said, the place where they offered sacrifices, let the foundations be laid. Let the golden and the silver vessels of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took, be took uh, out of the temple. All let it all be brought uh, back and be restored and brought again to the temple, which is at Jerusalem. And then it says this. And the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the rest of the children of the, ca of the captivity, kept the Hanukkah of this house of God with joy. There it is again. They kept the dedication of the house. So we see Hanukkah not only was a historical event, Hanukkah is also a very biblical event. As a matter of fact, the foundation of the second temple was actually laid at the same time frame when Hanukkah fell prophetically a couple hundred years later. Look at this. This is from Haggai, chapter 2, verse 18 through 22. It says, consider, I pray you, from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month. Well, guess what? The ninth month is Kislev. Hanukkah starts on Kislev 25. So here we see it's from the 24th day of the ninth month, even from the day the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Okay. And then it goes on and mentions a little bit later. You can see in the notes uh, in bold. It says the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Wow, this is very significant time frame. We have to understand that we need to look at the patterns. We need to be on God's calendar and we'll see history repeats itself over and over. Too often Christians look at prophecy from a Greek mindset. It's, it's like it's a checklist. Okay, happened, won't happen again. No, no, no. When it comes to prophecy, if it's happened before, it will definitely happen again. But it'll be from a different perspective. Now, here's the other thing I wanted to bring out. Did you know the actual event of Hanukkah was actually prophesied in the Bible as well? Let's go and look at the book of Daniel. We're going to go to chapter 8, and we're going to look at verse 3 through 11. And as Pastor Joe said, uh, you can look at the notes that I provided for you online, or you can open your Bible uh, if you think you can keep up. Uh, but let's look at Daniel 8, where Hanukkah was actually prophesied about several hundred years before it happened. 
in verse 3 through 11. All of you are familiar <clears throat> with Daniel's visions. Okay, well, here we see he lifts up his eyes and there stood before a river, a ram, which had two horns. Well, if you remember uh, through this vision, Daniel saw that Nebuchadnezzar was like this head of gold. He was the number one nation. He was at the top. But guess what? After him comes the Medes and the Persians. And so in this other vision, we see an analogy where now he sees a ram with two horns. And they were high, and one was higher than the other. The higher came up last. And he sees the ram pushing westward and northward and southward, and no one could stand before him, or no one could deliver him out of his hand. But look what happens. He says, as I was considering this, behold, there was a he-goat, or a male goat from the west, on the face of the whole earth, and he didn't touch the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Now, if you remember, after the Medes and the Persian, who comes next? Greece. It's the Greek empire. And so look what we find here. Uh, he comes to the ram that had the two horns which he had seen standing before the river. He ran in the fear of his power, and I saw him come close to the ram. He was moved with color against him, and he smote the ram, broke the two horns. There was no power in the ram to stand before him, and he cast him to the ground and stepped on him, and no one could deliver the ram out of his hand. Now, look at this. It says, then the he-goat became very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. Who was the great horn? None other than Alexander the Great. That's right. The head of the Greek empire was known as Alexander the Great. And here is this great horn. Okay. But here's what happens. Look at this. It says, when he was strong, this great horn was broken. In other words, the Greek empire is falling apart. And in his place come up four outstanding, basically, generals and from the four winds of heaven. And if you look at uh, the Greek empire, you go online, you Google it, you look at the images, you'll see Alexander's empire was uh, broken into four parts. He had his four generals all took over. And look at this. It says here, out of one of them came forth a little horn which became very great. That is speaking of Antiochus Epiphanes, the one who is the main actor in the whole story of Hanukkah and the time of the Maccabees, which is about 168 BC. Now look at this, and this is a prophecy. It says it waxed great even to the host of heaven, referring to Israel, because Israel shall be as the stars of heaven, the Bible says. And he cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground, and he stamped on them. He magnified himself even to the prince of the host. Now look here. By him, the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. All right. So now we see in Israel, the daily sacrifices were taken away. Listen to this. I'm going to quote Josephus. Josephus lived during the time of the Messiah. And listen to this. He says uh, in his book, Antiquity of the Jews, this is uh, book 12, chapter 6 and 7 is where this comes from. He said, it so fell out that these things were done on the very same day on which their divine worship had fallen off and was reduced to a profane and common use. And then it says, after three years time, so it was that the temple was made desolate by Antiochus, and so it continued for three years. Now, here it is. He said, this desolation came to pass according to the prophecy of Daniel, which was given 408 years before. Now, a lot of Christians read Daniel and see this as a future prophecy yet to happen, not realizing it already happened. This has already happened. But the point is this, if it's happened before, it will happen again. Okay, let's go to 30 AD for a minute when Messiah was here. Here it is. Here's where Hanukkah is even mentioned in the New Testament, the actual feast. But because of our English being so biased, what do we see here? 
In John 10, 22 through 24, it says it was at the Feast of Dedication. Well, what's the Hebrew word for dedication? Hanukkah. Why didn't they put it was the Feast of Hanukkah? It's almost like they're trying to hide that Hanukkah is mentioned in the New Testament. But Messiah is keeping the Feast of Hanukkah in Jerusalem. And it was winter. That's when Hanukkah is. And it says Jesus was walking in the temple in Solomon's porch and all the Jews surrounded him. And they said, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. I think that is so interesting that here they're asking Yeshua at the Feast of Dedication if he's the Mashiach. And when we went back to the book of Numbers, the first time Hanukkah is mentioned, we also see the Mashiach mentioned as well. Well, here's what we need to know, guys. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9, it says, That which has been is that which will be. That which is done is that which shall be done. There is nothing new under the sun. So how much new things are there? Nothing. There is nothing new under the sun. So in other words, that which has happened prophetically is going to happen again. Do you know it was after Noah's flood, the 40 days of rain, that the first appearance of the rainbow And when you look at the dates, that was right in the middle of Hanukkah. Yes, the first rainbow appeared right in the middle of Hanukkah. Well, not only that, Messiah was conceived during Hanukkah. Light entered the world at the darkest time of the year. Well, guess what? Matthew 24, when I say Matthew 24, almost everyone knows that's all about end times. Well, guess what? Matthew 24 is all about Hanukkah happening again. But because so many Christians don't know Hanukkah, they don't see all the parallels in Matthew 24. So I want to bring that out. Hanukkah, now what's the difference between Hanukkah and Purim? They're both very biblical feasts. Purim with Haman was all about annihilating God's people. Hanukkah is about assimilation, not annihilation. Now, you'll be annihilated if you don't assimilate, but that's what's happening right now in our world. The Hitler was a type of Haman wanting to kill all the Jews, but the Antichrist, who's going to appear on the scene very soon, is more interested in assimilation, but he will annihilate you if you don't assimilate. All right, so I want everyone to put your little Jewish hat on, and I'm going to transport you back 2,000 years, okay? Let's go back 2,000 years. You have to get your uh, Western English mindset completely gone for a minute here. I want you to put on your Jewish hat or kippah, I should say. And let's go look at Matthew 24, verse 3. Here it says, Messiah is on the Mount of Olives. Wow. Wow. And what happens? His disciples come to him privately saying, tell us what's going to happen. What will be the sign of your coming? And when will be the end of the world? Well, let's look at a modern day view of the Mount of Olives here on the slide. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Let's bring that next slide up. There you go. Can you believe it? That's the Mount of Olives today. But I want you to catch this. Uh, Go ahead and do the next uh, transition. It's going to bring up a Bible verse. Look at Matthew 24, 6. It says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. All right. Now, let me ask you something here. If you were one of his disciples on the Mount of Olives 2,000 years ago, and he's ta- and you, you hear Yeshua talking about the end of the world, and he says you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars, what wars are you thinking of? Can anyone tell me in the chat? or wherever. Can you think about it? What would be the wars that would be coming to your mind if you were one of Jesus' disciples 2,000 years ago? Well, I tell you what, the most previous war was Hanukkah. That was the most current war about 200 years earlier. Well, what war happened before Hanukkah war? It was Nebuchadnezzar destroying the temple on the 9th of Av. So what do we see here? The two wars that every disciple would have been thinking of is the destruction of the temple by Babylon in about 586 BC, and then the war of Hanukkah about 186 BC. All right, so wow, this is incredible that these are the two wars that they would be thinking of. So think about this. Guess what? Go to the next slide. Here they're thinking about 
the ninth of Av, when the temple was destroyed, and guess what? The next big war is World War I, and World War I started on the ninth of Av. This should tell us, wow, we are really in the last days. Well, guess what? Go ahead and go to the next slide. What do we find? Do you know George Allenby in World War I, not only did it start on the ninth of Av, it was at Hanukkah when he conquered Jerusalem and went walking through the streets of Jerusalem. He got off his high horse and he says, I'm not doing that, I'm walking. But here right now in the biggest war in our day, is tied to both wars that the Jews would have been thinking of back then. So tell this tells me this is a big clue. World War I was very significant prophetically, fulfilling both starting on the ninth of Av and the conquering of Jerusalem right in the middle of Hanukkah. I think this is huge. All right, so now let's look at how Matthew 24 is a parallel to what happened at Hanukkah and we can understand how Hanukkah is going to happen again. Okay, look at Matthew 24, verse 9 and 10. Uh, let me just see something here. Uh, oh, yeah. All right. So here we go. Matthew 24, verse 9 and 10. It says they're going to deliver you up to be afflicted and they're going to kill you. And you'll be hated of all nations for my namesake. Many will be offended and shall betray one another and hate one another. Do you know that's exactly what happened at Hanukkah? That's exactly what happened. They were delivered up. They were afflicted. They were killed. They were hated by the nations. Many Jews were even offended. And many Jews betrayed one another and hated one another. As a matter of fact, there was a big war between the religious Zeus, uh, the religious Jews, and the Hellenistic Jews, or the Jews that wanted to live according to Greek ways. In Matthew 24, 12, it says, because iniquity will abound, the love of many will wax cold. This is exactly what happened at Hanukkah. As a matter of fact, I'm going to read, uh, and I recommend everyone read the book of the Maccabees. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. I'm going to go ahead and bring these up right now. Uh, yeah, bring up that next slide, number seven. I wanted to give everyone the right time frame. Here you have Daniel, 576 BC, 408 years later, basically in 168 BC, is when you have Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, Antiochus IV. He installs this uh, horrible pagan statue of Zeus in the Holy Temple. And that was called the abomination of desolation. So that event that many put with the book of Revelation has already happened. It happened over 2,000 years ago. But again, like I said, history repeats itself. So go ahead and go to the next slide. And what you're going to find is uh, the Maccabees. In Hebrew, the word Maccabee means hammer. And they used that hammer to uh, conquer the Syrian Greek army. But let's take a look at back to our notes. Listen to this. This is from the book of Maccabees. And it says there sprang up a sinful offshoot. That's of the four generals. And his name was Antiochus Epiphanes. And Epiphanes means God manifest. So he thought he was God manifest in the flesh. And it says, in those days, there appeared in Israel transgressors of the Torah who seduced many other Jews. And they said, come on, guys, let's go make a covenant with the Gentiles who are all around us. Ever since we separated from the Gentiles, all these evils have come upon us. And it says the proposal was agreeable. Some of among the people promptly went to the king and he authorized them to introduce the ordinances of the Gentiles uh, and the Olympics were going on at this time, believe it or not. And they promptly built a gymnasium according to the Gentile custom, which means they all competed without any clothes on. Now, here's, a, here's something that's really a key. Look at Matthew 24, verse 15. It says, listen to what Matthew says. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by who? By Daniel, the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoever reads, let him understand 
This is in Matthew 24. Now realize they're saying, what? This has already happened. It's already been fulfilled. So the fact that they had already seen the abomination of desolation during Hanukkah spoken by Daniel the prophet happen. And then it says, whoever reads and let them understand, they're going, wow, then that means Hanukkah is going to happen again. As a matter of fact, let's look at the same use of these words in Daniel 11, verse 31 through 34. It talks about an arms will stand on his part. They'll pollute the sanctuary of strength. They'll take away the daily sacrifice. They'll place the abomination that makes desolate. And those who do wickedly against the covenant, he'll corrupt by flatteries. But the people that know their God will be strong and do exploits. And here it is. And they that understand among the people will instruct many. Wow, get a load of that. That's exactly what Daniel said would happen. That's exactly what Yeshua is saying has already happened and will happen again. And then uh, let's go to uh, the next. Uh, no, let's say right here. Let's go now <clears throat> for a moment. Look at Matthew chapter 24 and verse 16 through 18. Look at this. In Matthew 24, verse 16 through 18, Yeshua tells everybody that when this happens again, let those in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to get anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to get his clothes. So he's saying that everyone in Judea needs to flee to the mountains. Well, guess what? If you put your Jewish hat on and you knew your history from 200 years earlier, look what happened during the time of the Maccabees in First Maccabees 1, 62 through 64. It says, many in Israel were determined and resolved in their hearts not to eat any unclean food. They preferred to die rather than to be defiled with food or to profane the Holy Covenant, and many did die. And then it says, very great wrath came upon Israel. The officers of the king in charge of enforcing the apostasy came to this famous city of Modin. This is the famous city, Modin. It's right between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. And it says they wanted them to make a sacrifice to this pagan god. Well, many of Israel did actually join them, but there was one king named Matt, or this one man named Mattathias, and his sons drew together. And then the officers of the king addressed Mattathias. And listen to what they said You're a leader, you're an honorable and great man in this city supported by sons and kindred. So he says, come now, you be the first to obey the king's command. And then as all the Gentiles and all the Judeans and those who are left in Jerusalem have done. In other words, assimilate. Everyone else is doing it. You come do it too. And then it says, and then you will be numbered and your sons among all the king's friends. And you and your sons shall be honored with silver and gold and many gifts. But Mattathias answered in a loud voice, Although all the Gentiles in the king's realm obey him so that they forsake the religion of their ancestors and consent to the king's orders, yet I and my sons and my kindred will keep to the covenant of our ancestors. Now listen to what he said. Heaven forbid that we should forsake the law and the commandments. We will not obey the words of the king by departing from our religion in the slightest degree. And as he finished saying these words, look at this. A certain Jew came forward in the sight of everyone else to offer sacrifice on the, on the altar in Modin according to the king's order. Well, when Mattathias saw him, he was filled with zeal. His heart was moved and his just fury was aroused. It says he sprang forward and he killed him right there on the altar. At the same time, he also killed the messenger of the king who was forcing them to sacrifice. He tore down the altar. Thus, he showed his zeal for the law, just as Phineas did, if you remember in the Old Testament, uh, with Zimri, the son of Salu. Then look at what Mattathias cried out in the city. Let everyone who is zealous for the law, who stands by the covenant, follow me. And look what they did. Then he and his sons did what? They fled to the mountains, leaving behind in the city all their possessions. Well, guess what? 
the book of Maccabees was around 2,000 years ago, and all the Jews had read it, and they knew that they all fled to the mountains, which is why when Yeshua is telling them they need to flee to the mountains, they're going, wow, that's what we did 200 years ago. We're going to have to do this again. Now look at Matthew 24, 20, 21. It says, pray your flight is not in winter. Well, guess what? Hanukkah is in the winter. Pray that it's not on the Sabbath day. Well, guess what? That is very significant as well. Look at 1 Maccabees 2, verse 32 through 41. It says, uh, many hurried out after Mattathias, and having caught up with them, they camped opposite, and they prepared to attack them on the Sabbath. Okay, the Syrian Greeks were going to attack the Jews who had fled to all the mountains, fled to the caves. They're all in hiding, but the Jews are in hiding on the Sabbath day. And guess what? They're about to be attacked on the Sabbath day. And look what the pursuers said to them. Enough of this. Come out and obey the king's command and you will live. But they replied, we will not come out, nor will we obey the king's command to profane the Sabbath. So then what happened? The enemy attacked them at once, but they didn't even retaliate because it was the Sabbath. So they didn't retaliate. They didn't even throw stones. They didn't block up the places they were hiding. And they said, let us all die in innocence. Heaven and earth are our witnesses that you destroy us unjustly. Well, guess what? So the officers, the soldiers attacked them on the Sabbath day and they died with their wives and children, their animals to the number of 1,000 people. Well, guess what? When Mattathias and his friends heard of it, they mourned deeply and they said to one another, if we all do as our kindred have done and do not fight against the Gentiles for our lives and our laws, they will soon destroy us from off the earth. And so guess what? It was at that very time On that day, they came to the decision. They said, we can fight on the Sabbath, anyone who attacks us. Wow, that is historic. That is huge. For the first time in history, the Jews decided they can keep the Sabbath, but still defend themselves. This was so historical. And when the Yeshua said, pray it's not in winter, pray it's not on the Sabbath, Hanukkah was ringing in their ears. And they knew Hanukkah would happen again. Now, Here's the thing. Hanukkah is known as the festival of lights. Well, guess what? The lamps of the menorah or the Hanukkah are always lit as a reminder that we are to rededicate ourselves to God and his laws and we're not to fall for assimilation and lawlessness. Well, guess what? Look at this. Look at Matthew The very next chapter, we were just going over Matthew 24 in the end times. Well, guess what chapter comes next? 25. And it's about virgins' lamps who go out. That's referring right to the Hanukkah. Guys, look at this. Matthew 25, 1 through 4. The kingdom of heaven is likened to 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Okay. Five were wise. Five were foolish. Those that were foolish took their lamps but took no oil with them. The wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Well, look at Matthew 25, verse seven. What did they say? All the virgins arose, they trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, give us your oil for what? Our lamps have gone out. They have no oil for their lamps. Well, guess what? Look at Proverbs chapter 13, verse 9. The light of the righteous rejoice, but the lamp of the wicked will be put out. What an amazing connection. As a matter of fact, they had no light. We'll look at Proverbs 6, 23. The commandment is a lamp and the law, the Torah is light. Here, the five foolish virgins have rejected Torah. They have no Torah. As a matter of fact, look at Lamentations chapter 2, verse 9. It says, her gates have sunk to the ground. He has destroyed and broken her bars. This is at the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. Her king and her princes are among the nations. Now look at this. The law is no more and her prophets find no vision from the Lord. When the law is gone, you lose your vision. 
Look at Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision that people perish, but he that keeps the law is happy. Why? Because he keeps, he has vision. Now, one of the things that I recommend uh, that people do over the eight days of Hanukkah is to read Psalms 119. Now, I recommend you read about 24 verses every day uh, and have a discussion about what you read. It's, it's quite incredible. So that's what I recommend next week around this time Hanukkah begins. Take the time and read all about the law in Psalm 119. But here's the thing. Anti-Semitism has taken the church away from its biblical patterns and has gotten us off track. It's called replacement theology. We've taken the biblical Yeshua and transported him from the Middle East to Europe and the West. I tell you what, if I want to understand the culture of the nation of India and all of Indian traditions, would I go to Mexico and read everything they wrote in Spanish about India? I don't think so. Well, it's the same thing. Uh, when I go to China or Taiwan and I ask them where they got their Chinese Bible translation from, they go from the English. And I go, that is crazy. Why don't you get it directly from the Hebrew or directly from the Greek? When you go from Hebrew to Greek, to Latin, to Spanish, to English, to Chinese, don't you think you're going to lose something? Well, this is the problem with replacement theology. So I want to talk a little bit about replacement theology and all of its uh, problems. So go ahead and put that slide back up. Here is replacement theology. I want to show you what it has done. Replacement theology has turned Yeshua from this to the next slide. This. Ah, this is horrible. That's supposed to be Yeshua. And how in the world are you supposed to recognize him when he looks like that? I don't think he'd even recognize himself. And look at his hands. It looks like he has a bad case of arthritis as well. Oh, my goodness. Where does that hand signal come from? Hit the next uh, slide or hit the next transition and hit it again. Many of you in India know that there's like 500 million people who follow Buddha uh, from 500 BC, and that's a sign they use in Buddhism. Hit the next slide and you'll see Krishna also. There's over a billion people following Krishna, and this is from 2000 BC, and they do the same thing. The Catholics who have created this Jesus for everyone to worship has incorporated Buddhism and Hinduism into the artwork. I mean, this is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, go to the next slide. I mean, and we wonder why the Jews don't recognize Yeshua. Look what we're presenting. And it gets worse. Look at the next slide. He's not even holding a Hebrew Bible. He's got Greek texts. And look at all these different images. As a matter of fact, I don't think Jesus would even recognize his baby pictures. Look at this next slide. My goodness, we have a Chinese Mary and Jesus, an Indian uh, Mary and Jesus, Native American, I should say, uh, Mary and Jesus, an uh, African uh, Mary and Jesus. I mean, this white Mary and Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Here's the problem, guys. We have tried to create Jesus in our image rather than realizing we are created in his image. But look what replacement theology has done. It has gotten us totally off course. Now, uh, with that said, look at, go to the next slide. Here we have him in a pink robe for heaven's sake. This is supposed to be the Feast of Unleavened Bread and he's got a big loaf of bread in his hand. Go ahead and hit the next slide. I mean, this is crazy. Look what we're doing. Uh, I mean, this is just so ridiculous. I'm sure that's what he was thinking is, oy vey, what in the world? And he probably said, get me out of these clothes. That's what he's probably thinking here. I mean, I can't believe what artists do anymore. Uh, go ahead and do the next slide. Here, we're supposed to be reading a Hebrew text, but hit the next, uh, the down arrow. And we got Greek text. As a matter of fact, what do you, which one of these next pictures do you think looks like the Apostle Paul? Go ahead and go to the next slide. Which one do you think is the Apostle Paul? Uh, I bet you can probably tell. 
But this is what replacement theology has done. Now, I want to give you an example of what we do in Christianity in trying to create Jesus in our image. I'm going to give you a very practical example. Can anyone tell me who these people are? Does anyone know who these people are? Can anyone jump in on the chat room and tell me who they think that might be? Well, hmm, let's wait here. Let's see. Does anybody know? Ah, I'll bet you someone said that's Napoleon. Well, which one is Napoleon? Can anyone tell me which one is Napoleon? Guess what? None of them are Napoleon. Each one are artists who did a rendering of what they thought Napoleon looked like based on their own face looking in a mirror. Take a look at the next slide. Okay, here's Napoleon by Appiani, and here he did his own... Uh, painting of himself. Go to the next slide. Here you go. Here's this man named Ingress. Look, he made Napoleon look like himself. Go to the next slide. Here you go. Here's De La Roche is doing Napoleon and looks just like him. Go to the next slide. So what do we see here? This is exactly the problem. We don't even know what Napoleon looks like because every artist is really painting a picture of themselves and calling it Napoleon. And so uh, we have to realize we cannot create God in our image. We need to realize we were created in his image. All right. For time's sake, since I need to leave this about an hour. Well, I should I go ahead and close it there, Joe? No, you can continue, Pastor. Are you sure? Yes, absolutely. Okay, let me let me just jump through the rest of these. I have a little bit more. Uh, we'll make it go. Take, take, take your time. You're not okay. in a hurry. All right. I hope people are liking this anyway. Here we go. Yes, they're enjoying it. All they right. want to learn more. So I need to show you a little bit of history. Go to the next slide. Many of you probably have heard of Socrates. He was about 469 to 399 BC. His student was Plato. And I know everyone's probably heard of Plato. And I have the year that he was alive. His student was Aristotle. Well, guess what? His student was Alexander the Great, the guy that Daniel was prophesying about. Well, guess what? After Alexander and Alexander the Great, we come to Antiochus the Fourth, who lived until 163 BC. The Great Hanukkah event was around 168 BC. Then what happens? Then comes Cicero. Now, Cicero was a Roman, and he was from 106 BC to 43 BC. I want to give you this history because I want you to understand something. Go to the next slide. The next slide comes a Greek geographer who was a historian philosopher. But you have to understand Greek philosophy had been going on for about 600 years, okay? Greek philosophy, because the Greek empire overtook the Medes and the Persian, they were steeped in Greek philosophy. Well, there's a gentleman named Strabo, and if you'll notice, he lived during the time of Yeshua. This man lived at the same time Yeshua did. He was a lot older than Yeshua. He died about 23 of the current area or era or 23 AD. He wrote a book on geography. Very wise man. All right. I want you to uh, listen to what Strabo wrote. He wrote this. Listen, because most people, when they think of Greek philosophy, they think of uh, 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 what am I saying? Athens, Athens, or the place uh, in uh, Alexandria, Egypt. That was where all the Greek philosophers, the great universities, they had universities back then in school. So Alexandria and Athens were the great uh, philosophical universities were there 2,000 years ago. Well, guess what? Listen to what else Strabo said. He said this, he said, the people of the city of Tarsus, go ahead and go to the next slide. I want everyone to see Tarsus. Okay, right there's Tarsus. All right. Now you have uh, uh, Athens, Greece, uh, and then down uh, over by Egypt, you have Alexandria. But listen to what he said. In Tarsus, he said this, he says, it 
had become the number one city for being educated in Greek philosophy, even above Athens, even above Alexandria. If you wanted to know Greek philosophy, you had to go to the city of Tarsus. Well, who else do we know was a well-educated Roman citizen who grew up in Tarsus? That's right. It is the Apostle Paul. You got it. Go ahead and hit the next slide. Yeah, Rabbi Shaul, that's it. So Rabbi Shaul or Apostle Paul, guess what? He was smart. He spoke multiple languages. He was a Roman citizen. He spoke Latin. He was a Jew. He spoke Hebrew. He knew Aramaic. All right. And not only that, he uh, knew Greek. All right. So this guy is very educated. He'd been to the Greek philosophy university. Did you know Paul went to the Greek university to study ancient philosophy? You may not believe me. I'm going to prove it. Watch this. Do you remember when Rabbi Shaul went to, uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. He went to Athens and he uh, ran into the Epicureanism and Stoics, uh, or the Epicureans and Stoics. Epicureanism is the study of uh, Greek philosophers. Well, the Epicureans and the Stoics were steeped in Greek philosophy, and they were trying to figure out who this Apostle Paul was. Get a load of this. It was in Acts 17, 18, if you're looking at the notes. It says, there were certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered the Apostle Paul. And some said, what does this babbler want to say, right? All right, we'll get a load of this. In Acts 17, 22 through 27, if you know the story at all, here's Paul standing in the midst of the Oropagus, and he told the men of Athens that he found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one they worship without knowing was the one he proclaimed to them. And he explained that God gives life and breath and all things to everyone, that we were all blood brothers, that God has predetermined the times and the boundaries of their dwelling. So we should seek the Lord in the hope that we might find him. Well, get a load of this. Look at the next slide or click the next thing. This is going to be mind blowing. I'm sorry for a few people. It's, Paul says this, and, and you see this in Acts 17, 28. He says, for in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are his offspring. Get a load of this. Do you see that? It says, your own poets have said. There were no Greek poets. Were there any Christians in 200 BC? Of course there were no Christians in 200 BC. Okay, well, guess what? In 600 BC, there were no Greek pagans who knew God. Look at this. There is a Greek philosopher named Epimenides. He lived in the 6th century BC. He was a Greek seer and a philosopher poet. And remember, Paul just said, as your poets have said, Paul is actually quoting Epimenides. And look at the next slide. It says concerning Zeus. They fashioned a tomb for you, O holy and high one. The Christians are always liars, evil beasts, idle bellies, but you are not dead. You live and abide forever, for in you live and move and have our being. He wasn't talking about God. Paul was talking about Zeus. But Christians are around singing, in him we live and move and have our being, not knowing this was to Zeus. It wasn't to God. Paul is quoting the Greek philosophers trying to reach them through Greek philosophy. This is insane. Most people don't know Paul was quoting their poets and even says they're quoting their poets. Go to the next slide. And look at this, Titus 1.12, one of themselves, look at this, even a prophet of their own said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. Here again, he went to these Greek universities. He's trying to reach the Greek through Greek philosophy. And what was the lie that the Cretans always told? The Cretans said that Zeus wasn't God and wouldn't live forever. But they're saying, yes, he is too God. Can you see how crazy this is? Now, get a load of this. Go to uh, the next slide. There's another poet named Aratus from Cilicia. He lived around 300 to 240 BC. He wrote a book on astronomy. And look what he wrote. Go to the next slide. 
Let us begin with Zeus, whom we mortals never leave unspoken. For every street, every marketplace is full of Zeus. Even the sea and harbor are full of this deity. Everywhere, everyone is indebted to Zeus, for we are indeed his offspring. Paul even said that concerning Zeus, not Jesus, not Yeshua. But we don't study to show ourselves approved. We're thinking Paul is speaking about the Lord. He's not. He's talking about Zeus, but because we don't understand that he was trying, it's just like trying to reach the Muslims by always referring to Allah. God is not Allah. Well, Paul made this horrible mistake by trying to connect to the Greek philosophers by using Greek philosophy, and it didn't work. Look at the next slide. Meander, a Greek dramatist who also lived around 300 BC, which was the time during the Epicureans and the Stoics. He wrote over 100 comedies. Look what he wrote. Okay, go to the next slide. Evil communication corrupts good manners. What? Did you know that Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, he quoted that without giving proper credit. Here he almost plagiarized. Paul was actually plagiarizing because he never gave this guy credit, at least before he said, as your poets or prophets have said. This, he's quoting Greek philosophy from over 300 years earlier. This is what I'm talking about. This is how we ended up getting completely assimilated. As a matter of fact, uh, let's go to the next slide. I know this may be shocking, but here is uh, the wilderness where Moses set up uh, the tabernacle. All right. Well, I want to show you this. Uh, here's, here's a picture of Moses. He's got the Ten Commandments. But before we do any further on this slide, I want you guys to realize Paul gave up on the Greek mindset. That's why he said, forget the Greek philosophy. He said, I'm just going to speak about Christ and him crucified. Okay. Paul was a human. Okay. Paul made mistakes and we can see the mistakes, but Paul learned from those mistakes. But the problem, he stopped using Greek philosophy and he says, I'm just going to speak the cross and him crucified. As a matter of fact, there is no church of Athens in the New Testament, but here's the problem. The church, the people that he had won to the Lord, the Gentiles, they never gave up on the Greek philosophy. Their whole moral code was based on Greek philosophy, not on the Torah, because they didn't know Torah. All right. Now, let me ask you this. Is the media biased? How many believe the media is biased? I know it is here in the United States. Well, guess what? Look at Acts 7.38. In the King James Version, it says, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness. Wait a minute. Hit the next button. Hit your next slide down. Do you really think there was a church in the wilderness? Of course not. This shows you how bad the English translation is. The word is ecclesia or ecclesia, however you want to say it. But the stupid English translation says this was the church in the wilderness. There was no church in the wilderness. Give me a break. Go to the next slide. So what do we see here? Go ahead and go to the next. Go hit down. Go to the next one. Ecclesia, all it means is assembly. So we find the assembly, the, the word assembly can be translated as ecclesia or synagogue. Well, here's what happened. Because the English translators of your Bible were anti-Semitic, they took these two words that were actually synonyms, meaning the same thing, assembly. They translated ecclesia now as church because God wants to start something new. And synagogue, they translate as synagogue. Okay. But guess what? Look at this. As a matter of fact, in Acts 18, verse 26, it talks about how they began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And the word is synagogue. But get a load of this. In Acts chapter 19. Okay, okay, good. I got that. Okay, in Acts chapter 19, listen to this. Uh, this is when they're worshiping the goddess. Uh, Diana, okay, and for two hours, for two hours, they're crying out, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Well, look what happens in Acts 19.41 when it's over. It says, when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. Well, guess what? The Greek word is ecclesia. They should have put, he dismissed the church, but they go, oh no, the church, we can't make the church look like they're worshiping the great goddess Diana. So now 
we're going to correctly translate it as assembly. So the English translators, because of their bias, would pick and choose when it would be church and when it would be assembly. But it gets worse. Look at James, which isn't even James. His name is Jacob. But it says, if there comes into your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come also a poor man. Everyone knows James 2, 1 and 2. Well, guess what? The Hebrew word for assembly there is, I mean, the Greek word, the Greek word for assembly is synagogue. That means synagogue. Oh, but we can't have people believe they were meeting in a synagogue. So we're going to take the Greek word synagogue and translate it as assembly. Well, now look at Revelation 2, 9. Many of you are familiar with the verse that says those who are of the synagogue of Satan in the Greek word synagogue. But why didn't they translate that as the assembly of Satan. Ooh, because now we want to associate the synagogue to Satan. So one time they'll, tra uh, they'll translate synagogue as assembly and another time as synagogue. Sometime ecclesia will translate as church and other times as assembly. Again, it is totally biased. Now, did you know I can uh, show you a verse in your Bible where the apostle John, the apostle John loved the Lord. The Lord loved the Apostle John. But did you know the Apostle John was kicked out of the church? Yes, he was. He, the Apostle John, and all the Jews were kicked out of the church. I'm going to show you that this is a verse almost nobody sees in their Bible, but it shows you how quickly they kicked the Jews out of the church. All right. Uh, do you remember in Mark chapter 10, verse 42 through 44, Jesus called uh, the, his disciples and he said, you know that those who want to rule over the Gentiles exercise their lordship over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it's not to be that way among you. Whoever wants to be great, you be the servant of all, right? Well, get a load of this in First John. Okay. No, I'm sorry. Third John. In Third John. Chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, listen to what it says. The Apostle John wrote this, and he says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, that's a lover of Zeus, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. What? This Gentile Christian minister who only knew Greek philosophy was already kicking the Apostle John and the other Jews out of the church. It says, John says, therefore, if I come, I'm going to call to mind his deeds, which he does, Prating against us with malicious words and not content with that. He himself does not receive the brethren, that's the other Jews, and forbid those who would, kicking them out of the church. The first time people were kicked out of the church was when John was still alive uh, and the Gentiles took over with their Greek mindset and they kicked all the Jews, even the Apostle John, out of the church. So that's the result of anti-Semitism. That's what I wanted to touch on. So during Hanukkah, that's coming up, Read Psalm 119, get tied into the law, don't fall for this assimilation. So thank you, Pastor Joe, we'll turn it back over to you. That's awesome. awesome. Really, really thank you, uh, Pastor. We really appreciate you to helping us to go through understanding what the whole Greek philosophy did to our thought of faith and how we need to return back to the Hebrew or Jewish roots of our faith. We extremely thank you and we look forward to having you more often to teach and maybe next time we won't put any time restriction on you but you're welcome to if you have actually in fact more to teach you can we are not uh, yeah. we, we still have about two more hours to go in this part of the world we don't have time restrictions but uh, I know it's I very, get to bed and teach. I know teaching at El to die. So we next time what we're gonna do is we'll uh, maybe try and get you when it is morning for you, so it'll be much easier. Uh, but at this point, we just want to thank you. We appreciate you. We uh, appreciate El Shaddai Ministries for standing with us all this time. You know, many times people, sometimes people ask me, who's my pastor? Friends, I want to let you know that Pastor Mark Bills has been our pastor for the last 11 to 12 years from the time we started Kehilat uh, Bethlehem, the House of Bread. And he's been uh, with us, supporting us, standing with us, counseling us, encouraging us. He's a great man of God. He and his wife, Vicky, along with El Shaddai Ministries, have been our extended family. So every time we listen to him week after week, we feel so much at home. 
Well, I just so I'm not going to keep you anymore. Thank you, Pastor, for joining us. God bless you. Shabbat shalom to everybody at El Shaddai. Thank you. Bye-bye. So, friends, I really hope that you understood what, what he was sharing was just a glimpse of, of uh, what replacement theology does or did to uh, to our, our faith, our belief system. There's much more to look into it and how even how the church fathers uh, changed so many things over the process, the concept of assimilation. So as Hanukkah is coming next week, I just want you to know it begins, the first night of Hanukkah begins uh, this coming Thursday night. And God willing, every, every night we will come up with a small series of concerning Hanukkah and how we can let our light shine forth in the world during the season. And remember next week, Friday, Saturday, God willing, uh, I will come up with a two-part teaching concerning the light of the world and Hanukkah. And uh, if you've never heard about this, I would really encourage you to be here next, uh, next Friday, Saturday, and during the whole week, eight days of Hanukkah, we'll have special teachings, special lightings, and we will experience the beauty of what Hanukkah is. So if you, I would really encourage you, if you can get a hold of uh, the book of Maccabees, Maccabees 1, Maccabees 2, it, and just start reading it so that basically you will understand the background of what is happening uh, around Hanukkah time. It's all about assimilation. It is all about changing our mindset and becoming like the world and having Greek philosophy. It's something that Hashem is wanting us. You know, those of you who were here yesterday, we talked about from the book of uh, Obadiah. We talked about how a Messiah's, Messiah will come and destroy the mountain of Edom. Esau and how that whole transformation is going to take place. It's not a physical battle, but it is a spiritual battle for those of us who are still in the city of Edom, in the city of Seera. Hashem, Yeshua is calling us to return back to the Jewishness of the Bible and to understand the scriptures in its proper context. With that said, I really encourage you to try and buy uh, decoding the prophet Jeremiah. And uh, uh, if you are able to buy it physically, get a physical book. There's nothing like but a physical book. But for those of you who are not able to get it, it is very important to understand that uh, you can uh, uh, have a Kindle version of it in this part of the world. So, but before we go, I thought it would very important. It is very important for us to go ahead and listen to the interview Pastor Mark gave with Sid Roth from It's Supernatural. It's a beautiful interview concerning the book, uh, decoding the uh, prophet Jeremiah. I think it's very important for us to listen to this. And after we listen to this, I really encourage you to go ahead and buy this book. It's very important for our times to know, to help us understand what should we be doing, especially with the vaccines coming up and so many things happening. We're not, I'm not too sure if it is even authenticated and what are the side effects of this very fast fledged vaccine, which has just come and how the world and the nations are rushing to bring something out and they're joining together to join as fam uh, to uh, as world powers coming together. These are very, very important seasons. These are not just any season, but these are seasons and times which scriptures talk about in Matthew 24, the book of Revelation talks about it. And I believe that we should be ready. And not many of us will not be ready if we do not know what it means to be prepared to be the bride. Many, I believe that many, many people uh, are telling people that, you know, how, the only way to prepare is to get ready to be raptured. Friends, I'm not talking about get ready to leave the earth. We need to be ready on how we can be the light. Not because we don't have the master, not because we don't have Yeshua. We need to be ready. We need to be prepared. We need to be intelligent. We need to be smart. We need to have wisdom. We need to have the grace of God. We need to know what it means to be the light. Remember when the flood came, Noah was not raptured. Noah was there. Noah was put in the, in the ark and he was protected. When the whole issue of the Tower of Babylon came, we see that Abraham, he was not raptured. He was there. And very clearly, in, if you read clearly, look into 
Matthew 24. It's basically talking about how we, the people of Hashem, would be ready to be the bride. The question is, are you willing? Do you desire to be the bride of the Messiah during these days? Then it's time for you not to be in your own island, but to be connected with the community and together. It's not about an individual. It's about the body coming together and being one. When I say one, it doesn't mean that we do all the same things. It being one is the soundness of mind and the spirit that together we will seek, we will understand. We have only one motivation. We have only one encouragement. We have only one goal is to see the kingdom of God come. With that said, let's go ahead and listen to this uh, interview with uh, Sid Roth and Pastor Mark Mills. Well, my friend Mark Mills is here, and uh, Mark is a pastor. He's also a Jewish believer in the Messiah, like myself, but he has such a unique gift for Bible teaching. Uh, the supernatural started out with you at a young age. You were in the eighth grade and you bumped into an angel. What happened? Yes, it was unbelievable. I had run away from home. And so I had my little pillow and sleeping bag and backpack. And I was out in this wooded area by a highway. And my sister, a year older, my brother, a year younger, were out calling, looking for me. And I was crying out to God saying, what should I do? Should I tell him where I'm at or not? And I heard this booming voice. I mean, like a, a police megaphone. And it sounded like my dad's voice. So it was really audible. It was audible. And it said, Mark, tell the kids where you are. And this happened three times. So finally, I told them they came running over. And then out of nowhere, uh, we all agree had to be an angelic person. This is a small town of 800 people. Everybody knows everybody. It's 10 o'clock at right. night. And this a young man comes up and he says, can I be of any help? And my sister says, no, everything's fine. He's going to go home. And the being said, well, home is where Mark belongs. We had never seen him before. No one knew who he was. We'd never seen him again. And it was quite. Uh, and it wasn't your father with the booming voice. The booming, my dad was crippled. He couldn't go anywhere. I thought he was in a police car or something. And he stayed at home. It was just my sister and brother. I, I'm curious. At that time, did you realize? it was an angel when i got when we got home we all talked about it we all thought it had to be an angel because none of us knew him but, but you do so many unique things as you study the bible for instance you'll take an individual book of the bible and actually put it in chronological order um why do you do that? Well, for me, it's to help me understand it. When I was reading the book of Jeremiah, I found it was just all messed up. So I decided to put it in order so I could make sense of it and realize as I compared it to other prophetic books, wow, it painted a big picture. Uh, Mark, when you put things in chronological order, you find that history actually repeats itself. Oh my goodness, yes, and the same patterns. It's all about the pattern. And the patterns that happened in Jeremiah day is also happening in our day. And when you put the patterns together, uh, you can tell what's coming. You find even patterns in the warnings. Oh, uh, definitely, definitely. Just like what's fascinating is God's people in that day, they were not serving God. They wanted nothing to do with him. And he would write warnings. Jeremiah would be writing warnings that they need to repent. And yet at the same time, they were totally ignoring God's warnings. Well, actually, there are such similarities in Jeremiah compared to today. Uh, tell me what are some of the similarities? Well, one of the similarities that I think of is uh, is Revelation uh, chapter three, verse 20, where the Lord is standing at the door knocking. Uh, that's not the door of an unbeliever. That's the door of the church. And it's like God is standing outside the church knocking on the door. And they're saying in Revelation, leave us alone. We're having church. They didn't even know God was missing. Well, there's a scripture that talks about these patterns repeating themselves, I believe, in Ecclesiastes. Yes, it's chapter 1, verse 9. And that's where it talks about uh, basically that which has happened is that which will happen again. There's nothing new under the sun. So by doing this research, I have to believe that you know that you can have a, a, a leg up on what's happening in society since history keeps repeating. Even the Bible says that history keeps repeating. That's right. God declared the end from the beginning. So if we really want to know the end of the matter, you have to look at the beginning and the pattern. As we said in Jeremiah's day, 
Uh, it was uh, lawlessness like we have today. There were a few things. Yes. Yeah. Total lawlessness, chaos, uh, total uh, political upheaval, social unrest. One of the amazing things to me uh, is revealed in Matthew 24, where it talks about how nation will rise against nation. Mm -hmm. Really, that's ethnic group will rise against ethnic group. That makes a big difference. And when you look at what's happening today with the ethnic groups rising against ethnic group, total parallel. This is what we have to understand. So do you believe that that is uh, that that is actually what went on in Jeremiah's day? Oh, you bet. Oh, yeah. They had there was even fights between the rich and the poor. Uh, it was it was both totally social unrest in now, every area. Now, you live in Seattle, Washington, <laughs> uh, where all that stuff is going on. Now, you found in these patterns that God always warns before judgment. He always brings warning for, before judgment because he's not willing that any should perish. But the problem is so often, and the amazing thing, the warnings usually are to his people. It's not, God is more upset at his people turning against him than the heathen turning against him. Well, doesn't it say judgment begins at the house of God? Exactly. That's exactly what it says. And so God always wants to deal with his people first. And we see that again in Revelation where he's dealing with the seven churches. That's who he deals with before he deals with the nation. Now, Mark must really, really relate to the prophet Jeremiah, especially when you found out his eating habits <laughs> were the yeah. same eating habits that Mark had. That is so funny. But yeah, when you compare again Jeremiah to Revelation, the apostle John was given a scroll and told to eat God's words. All right. And he says it was sweet in his mouth and bitter in his belly. Well, that's the same thing that happened with Ezekiel in Jeremiah's time. He also was given the scroll of the word of the Lord and told to eat it as well. And then we find Jeremiah also. It says he also ate the word of God, you know, and so we need to realize if we want to really understand these last days, we need to be feeding on the word of God. Too often. All That's what you mean by eating. Yes. Yes. Really ingesting it. How do you ingest it? Well, uh, to me, it's uh, just read. I, I read all the time. Uh, and it's not so much memorizing. This is like a computer. If you get it in, God can pull it out. Revelation comes alive. Living revelation will come if you eat the word of God. The most important example I can give was when I had a gun at my head. A robber was ready to blow my head off and he told me to lay down face on the floor. Well, my mind was fight or flight, but all of a sudden the word of the Lord came into my mind and he brought back something I had read from Proverbs chapter two. And here the guy says, lay down the floor. And because I had eaten the word of God, the verse came up that says, when sudden fear comes upon you, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, it will be sweet. And that was God uh, talking, speaking to me. And so, so, so your mind would not know anything like that. But it came because you ate the word and it came right out of your spirit. Exactly. Well, here's the big question. That's wonderful for Mark. Well, what about me? What about that? <laughs> well, I think if they eat the word of God, God will bring revelation to them. It depends. Do they treat the word of God like their worst tasting vegetable or do they treat it like the best tasting dessert? And we need to just love the word of God and jump into it and ask God for revelation and to bring it back up when we need it, because it is an ever present help in time of need. But you have to eat it and adjust it for God to bring it back out. So feed your spirit every day, three meals a day, at least. Um, what warnings to the nations did you find as you decoded the prophet Jeremiah? Well, there's a couple of different warnings. One of them, there are several chapters where he's warning all these different nations that they better submit to Nebuchadnezzar because that is the person that God had put in charge. But the biggest warnings was he was warning all the nations on how they treat the nation of Israel. And if they don't treat the nation of Israel right, they're in big trouble. As a matter of fact, God says that after the 70 years of captivity where he punished Israel, he's going to turn around and judge all the nations on how they treated Israel. And so it's very important that we realize God is still in covenant uh, with the Jewish people. In other words, people look at it as just history, but that is a reality today and forever. 
of, of course, matter of fact, in Jeremiah uh, 31 with the new covenant uh, and other places, God says his covenant will never leave. As long as their sun and the moon is there, uh, his covenant will be broken with Israel. And, and what about another thing that a lot of people talk about, the Islamic radicals? And the two-state solution. Oh, exactly. Uh, a lot of that uh, pertains to the book of Jeremiah. And today, God said he's going to come against every nation that tries to part his land. Uh, and so we, the nations had better pay attention to that. And uh, who is Babylon today? Who, that's a great question. A lot of people ask me that. Uh, is Babylon a religion? Is Babylon a political system? Is Babylon a location? Well, as you very well know, there could be 70 different layers. I think it could be a political system, a religious system, and it's mostly just fleeing idolatry. And, and uh, what about the smart arrows? Oh, I thought that was interesting. When you read Jeremiah, it talks about uh, after the 70 years, uh, God's going to come against Babylon. And it basically it says they will have like expert arrows from an expert man. And I think it was interesting back in 91 when uh, everyone came against Iraq, they had smart bombs, uh, missiles that were like arrows. Uh, and so I think it's very interesting how prophetic God is in letting us know what's coming. You know what? I get the feeling you're not just doing this for this show. You feel <laughs> that excited about the word of God. Oh, I, I love the word of God. I, it's my passion. Uh, I just want to uh, eat it up because to me, it's so important for our lives today. It's more than history. It, it's, it's alive because it tells us how we need to and what we need to do right now. What kind of people? from your studies in Jeremiah and other books of the Bible is God looking for right now? Because if there's ever been a time to be right with God, now is the acceptable time. Oh, for sure. God is looking for a humble people. Uh, and he's, he's looking for people that want to obey him from the heart. It can't be just an obedience out of fear. God is looking for people who want to magnify the laws. We live in a period of lawlessness. And so God is looking for people who want to magnify his laws, make it honorable again. Just like Washington's laws are different than the North Carolina's laws. Well, laws tell you a lot about the lawmaker. And so for me, when I look at God's laws, I try to look at the reason behind the, who, what the heart is of the person who gave the laws. I don't see it as legalism. Those guys, it's like, what do I have to do to be saved? I got to do this law or that law. No, I feel like a, a little kid uh, that just wants to do to make dad happy. Okay. Is there something in Jeremiah that explains the coronavirus? Next. Well, because history repeats itself, because the Bible prophecies, most people miss this, uh, we are told that the prophecies repeat themselves. That's where a lot of teachers get messed up. They say, oh, that already happened, but it's going to happen again. Uh, so there are revelations right now, like today's newspaper from the prophet Jeremiah. Yes, uh, one of the interesting things that I find is in Jeremiah 12, where Jeremiah is whining. Uh, but it's so, like so many of us today, uh, he asked God, why do the wicked prosper? It's not fair. Why do you allow them to take root and produce oh. fruit? And so God says to Jeremiah, look, if the running with the footmen have wearied you, what are you going to do when it's time to run with the horses? And so in the book of Jeremiah that I wrote on decoding Jeremiah, I teach people how to run with the horses uh, because people of faith are runners. Abraham ran, Isaac ran, Rebecca ran, Elijah outran horses. And so when it comes to one of the things that are happening today is the coronavirus. Right. And people are asking if I think this is the judgment of God. Well, you know what? I don't think so. Here's how I look at it. If God tells you, don't put your hand in the blender when it's running, it'll cut off your fingers. And then we go and put our hand in the blender. We can't say that was God's fault. God's judging me. It's because we weren't obeying. Well, it's the same thing. Uh, God, has, we're bringing judgment upon ourselves. As a matter of fact, in Jeremiah, God says your own wickedness will correct you. And I think what is happening in the world today is reacting. 
reacting to all of the lawlessness that's happening. It's not that God's judging us as much as the lawlessness is correcting us. And when I think of what happened with the coronavirus, here's what I think. I think we have to love what God loves and hate what God hates. And in Proverbs 6, it mentions seven things that God hates that are an abomination. Guess what? The first one is a proud look. Well, my goodness, that was the problem in Jeremiah's day was pride. Look what's happening in our day. God is taking, just like he took all the idols down in Egypt, he's taking the idols down, the entertainment idols, the sport idols, all of these idols that we have been trusting in, he's taking them down. And in Jeremiah, he tells the king and queen to humble themselves. Well, that's what's happening full of pride. The other thing that God hates, it says, the second thing after a proud look is a lying tongue. Look at all the fake news, full of fake news. And that's what was happening in Jeremiah's day. The prophets were all prophesying lies, giving fake news. And the third thing, the last thing I'll mention uh, is hands that shed innocent blood. Look at all the innocent blood that's being shed. Back then, they were offering children to Molech. Well, today we have the abortion issue. So everything is parallel, which is why the nation of Israel is experiencing what it is in Jeremiah's day and what we're experiencing today. Now, you say going back to coronavirus that you call it a trial run. I, I really think that just like the horses of Revelation are coming, okay, I believe what we're experiencing right now is a trial run because God wants us to make sure we're spiritually fit. Can we run with the spiritual horses when they come? So I really believe that what we're going through right now is preparing us for harder times so that we know where we need to get fit spiritually. The other thing said about the coronavirus that is totally amazing to me is this is the first time in 3,500 years that on the very same day that God had all of Israel on the lockdown in quarantine within their houses, all of Israel was also in quarantine as well as the rest of the world. Like God was getting all of Israel to finally keep the Passover correctly. And that is amazing to me that that is the first time that has happened in 3,500 years, which is why this year is so important. Uh, well, and that's kind of interesting because in the word, it says you have to remain in your house on Passover. This was the first time in 3,500 years they were locked into their house. They had to remain in their house. Has to be very prophetic. And it was the same day. It was on the same day of the week as well. You, you teach about how to have peace in the midst of chaos, that we're not alone. There are a lot of people that are watching us right now that feel alone, isolated. Totally. Talk to them. Talk sure. to them for a while. Uh, uh, one of the most important things that we can learn from the prophet Jeremiah is we decode Jeremiah when we compare it to what was going on with Ezekiel and Daniel. Do you know the very same time that the three Hebrew children were thrown into the fiery furnace over in Babylon, here the Lord appeared in the midst of that chaos. Back in Jerusalem, it was at the same time King Jehoiakim was cutting the word of the Lord into three pieces and threw it in the fire. Just as the word of the Lord was thrown into the fire in Jerusalem. Excuse me, that was the the, uh, the three Jewish Hebrew children. children were in the fire. Remember in Daniel? Go ahead. Yes, in uh, Daniel, uh, the first few chapters, two and three, we see the three Hebrew children uh, because they didn't worship the statue of Nebuchadnezzar, they were thrown in the fiery furnace. But what you find out, the same time in Jerusalem, the, the Baruch, Jeremiah's scribe, wanted to warn Israel and, and Jehoiakim not to do what they're doing. And he cuts up the word of the Lord into three or four pieces and throws it in the fire in Jerusalem. The very same time the word of the Lord is thrown in the fire in Jerusalem, the word of the Lord appears in the fire in Babylon with the three Hebrew children. Well, you need to know, just like the three Hebrew children, when you're in the midst of the fire that you're going through and feeling all alone and under stress, know that the Lord is with you. Amen. 
such a powerful thing. I think that's really, really amazing, friends. Uh, this is this is something very, very important for our times. Through Prophet Jeremiah, Hashem is not just warning some group of people. He's warning the body of Messiah. And I really pray that we would get the book, start reading the Bible, start reading the book of Jeremiah in the Bible and get along with that. Now, remember, Pastor Mark's book is not the Bible. So it's, it just helps us to understand the book of Jeremiah in the Bible. So it's very, very important that you buy, read first the Bible, the book of Jeremiah. If you've never got an opportunity to read it, now is the time to read it because Hashem is trying to teach us something and the book will basically help us to understand what and which direction. So like I, I said before, the question is, are we ready? Are we willing to be prepared, to be prepared to be the bride? If we are going to be ready to be, to be the bride of the Lord, that means we have no other plans. We have no other motivations. We have no other intentions. Our only focus is Hashem building his kingdom. I'm not saying that you should not work. I'm not saying that you should not have money to live. That's not what I'm talking about. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. We need to search our hearts and need to see if we are willing to run along with what Hashem wants us to run along. Just like how Elijah had to, Elisha had to go along with Elijah and Elijah focusing on Hashem and Jeremiah and all these men of God, how they focused on God. This is the season. I am calling the body of Messiah, not only in India, but the A Asian nations and the nations of the world to come along and let us together build the kingdom wherever you are. Partner with us in this part of the world. Support the work in India and do whatever it can to come along with us so that together we will see the fullness of the Messiah come. Together we will be more effective. Together, we will be more strong. Together, we will be united. It's not divided. It divided, we will not be strong. But together, in unity, we will be effective and powerful. And Hashem can use us during the season. With that said, friends, if you have been blessed by this morning's uh, word and teaching, I would really encourage you to go ahead and like the video and share the video. And I also like you to go ahead and uh, consider supporting the work in this part of the world. It is our dream. Like last week, I was talking about many people having a dream. We have a dream. Our dream is to see the Jewish roots of our faith be spread all over this nation of India and all over the nation's of Asia and beyond. For that, we can't do it by ourselves. We need your help. So would you please consider supporting? If you have no other place that you are supporting, and if you consider this your home, would you consider giving your tithes and offerings unto the Lord so together we can build the kingdom of God? Just want you to know, today is Shabbat. It's a great day to give. I know our service is closing. Usually we have a little more, but today we are closing for now. But remember, 3 p.m. today, Wisdom Talks. Don't miss that. It's a great thing. We are focusing on the book of Proverbs. The wisdom in the Bible is basically about the Shekinah, the presence of God. In these days, we can't go on uh, auto mode. We need the presence of God. We need the power of God. We need his strength for everything we do, not just when we come together for every situation of, the, of our life. We need Hashem. So until we meet again, remember next week, this come following for Thursday, Hanukkah starts. It's eight day long festival. The first light of candles of Hanukkah begins on Thursday night. I'm going to come along every week to teach about Hanukkah, special teachings concerning the light of Messiah, Friday and Saturday, and the rest nights, small, small snippets or tidbits concerning uh, the light of the Messiah and how we can be prepared and be the light. So if you don't have a Hanukkah, you can start making 
a, a nine candle branched Hanukkah and it will be an awesome thing. And those of us, even if you don't have, you can make it with candles or make it with diyas or make it with oil. However it is, this is the season to spread. So if you are interested in celebrating the feasts of the Lord, this is one of the feasts that even Yeshua celebrated. That's what John chapter 10 talks about. He was there in the temple during the feast of dedication. Hanukkah is all about dedicating. And I pray that in the season, we will dedicate our lives once again back unto Hashem. Amen. May the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov bless you and keep you. Shabbat Shalom. And thank you for joining us. And we will see you at 3 p.m. India time for Wisdom Talks. Kol Tov.